Hey, y'all, and welcome to our Poker Insider Space. We're excited for all of you to meet our guest tonight. Until then, we would like to remind everyone that our past spaces are recorded. So if you missed any of them, please find them on my, my Twitter feed or Brian's. Um, you will find last week's recording of Nicholas Rigby, as well as others such as Robert Turner, the Chip Burner, Veronica Brill, and Dutch Boyd. Now for a word about our sponsor, Elevator Results, whose purpose is to provide, oh, excuse me, whose purpose is to provide a service to help people reach their desired fitness goals, whether to be gain weight, to lose weight, or to imp improve their sports performance. Elevator Results can help you reach your goals. Now to our guest's intro. Our guest is originally from Innes, Ireland. He is an ambassador for Unibet Poker and cards ch and a cards chat poker expert. He and his co-host David Lappin produce a great podcast called The Chip Race. Dara is the co-author of four poker books with Barry Carter. His best life cash is for his second place finish in the 2015 WSOP $1,500 no limit event for just over $262,000. According to his Hendon mob, he has a total life earnings of one point over one point two million, including thirty WSOP caches. To sum it up, Dara O'Kearney is a poker player, author, blogger, podcaster, poker coach, and so much more. Please welcome Dara to our space. Dara, you're going to, um, you can request, I sent you an invite, Dara. If you just request in the bottom left, it'll speed up the process. I'm sorry that sometimes it's just not working too quickly. Yeah, the microphone button there in the bottom left, that helps. So how's your week going, Sherry? It's going well, Brian. How are you? Great. Uh, Busy, crazy week, but we're headed into Labor Day weekend. You know, we used to spend, as a kid, we would spend the entire Labor Day weekend, the week before Labor Day, Labor Day weekend, guess where we would go, Sherry? Give I hope the guess. beach or the lake. No, come on, <laughs> Las Vegas, where else would I go? <laughs> Where do you think I got this from? Viva Las Vegas, of course. Yes. Um, Dara, there is a, a toggle in the bottom left corner of your... Um, oh, and if, you're, your... and if you're on your... Uh, yes, computer... I was just getting ready. Yeah. Go, ahead. Sorry. Go, Sorry. go ahead. No, go ahead. You need to be on your, your cell phone to be able to request, too. I, I was actually... I had heard... Um, that they were starting to let you do it on your desktop. So I was trying to do that here earlier, actually, and uh, found that I couldn't request from a computer. So that's another thing that uh, that happens sometimes. So. Well, and we'll give you a minute to figure that out, Dara. Don't, uh, don't fret, bud. And uh, if you need to send us a message, please do, um, and we'll figure it out. So, Brian, yeah. why don't yeah, you so tell us how that new job okay. is going, bud? Oh, well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you ever work for somebody and you're like working your butt off and then they throw you under the bus to upper management. <laughs> like this was not a good start for these clowns because uh -oh. yeah. I will let you get away <laughs> with that once, but uh, probably will not happen again, you know? Um, yeah, that's so, probably one of the millions of reasons why I don't do that work thing for somebody else anymore. Yeah, well, and I never have. I mean, that's kind of the, probably a little bit the rub, you know. Um, and this one, I am still like a contractor, but usually I would have people doing this part of the job and uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Welcome, well, Dara. Welcome, Dara. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I was trying to get on my desktop. That was the issue, and it wasn't working. Well, and I'm sorry we didn't think to to tell you that ahead of time, being this uh, is the popping of your cherry yeah. as far as space <laughs> is concerned. Bit of a miracle. I, I mean, here at all, I think. <laughs> but, yeah. I'm sorry, bud. I'm sorry we just didn't think about that. Um, 
you know, we get kind of uh, tunnel vision and we just think everybody's in our world, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. But we we got you here now. We're glad you're here. And I'm going to open with the first question. And then I'm, I, I want to introduce you to my co-host, Brian. Hi, Brian. Hey, how are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm going to shoot you a question. I'm sure Brian's going to jump in there. Um, yes. And this is totally not even having to do with poker, just because I like to um, have folks um, get to know our guests on all kinds of different levels. So I have read that you're an international ultra runner, and I have no idea what that is. Could you explain what that is, please? Yeah, basically, um, ultra marathons, which is what ultra runners do, it's any distance longer than a marathon. So that goes from just slightly longer than a marathon. Um, the shortest ultra marathons are 50 kilometers, which is basically five miles longer than a marathon. Wait, um, there's people that want to run longer than a marathon? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the, I, I ran all the way up to 24-hour races, which, as as it, as, it's, as the name suggests, means running for 24 hours. Wow. Um, but there are even longer races. Uh, there are six-day races as well. Um, and uh, there's also, I think, the longest one in the world is... 5,000 kilometers, um, and usually the winner takes about 42 days. So, that yeah. is incredible. I can't even wrap my mind around that. We have people trying to do like a marathon space here on Twitter, and they're complaining, you know, that it's uh, it's uh, hard work. And I just can't imagine a 42 day race. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it, it all depends where you start from. Like, I started running quite late uh, in my early 30s, and I remember in the early days, even running one mile was difficult. But um, yeah, I got to the stage where I was running marathons fairly easily. And then I decided to try the even longer stuff. And it turned out I was better at the longer stuff than, That's uh, than, amazing. than, than the marathons, which is why I ended up running internationally for Ireland. That's amazing. Congratulations on that accomplishment. Honestly, <laughs> I'm just mind boggled. Um, I, I just dabbled in running for the first time in my life about eight years ago. And I loved every minute of it. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm uh, in the worst shape of my life right now. But hopefully in about 18 months, I'll be running on that track again. So you may be inspiring me just a little bit tonight. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, pastime. It's it's something I absolutely love doing still, um, even though I don't do it competitively anymore. Um, I was still doing it at the start of my poker career, but I found it too difficult to balance the two. Um, because the amount of training I had to do and then the amount of time I was spending playing poker is something I had to give, basically. Amazing. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so how long have you been playing? When, like, yeah, I, again, I start. it's a common theme here, but I, I tend to start everything late in life. I started running in my early 30s. I started playing poker in my early 40s. Um, so I've been playing for 15 years now, roughly. Oh yeah, um, and and you uh, did a master class with uh, Ryan's site. I see here for lo that's, learning pro poker. That's right, yeah. Uh, specifically on satellites, which are a bit of, spe of a specialty of mine. Um, the first book I wrote was on satellites, and um, then Ryan came to me and said he'd like me to do a master class on satellites. So, uh, so I did it with with him and learn pro poker. And let's go ahead and, and go over the list of your book titles that you co-authored with um, uh, Barry Carter. You, of course, just mentioned your poker satellite book, uh, satellite strategy book. You've also done a mystery bounty poker strategy book, a PKO poker strategy book, and an endgame poker strategy um, book. What would you say was your favorite book to write? Which one did you appreciate yourself? Uh, yeah, funnily enough, I was talking to Barry about this today, and, and we both agreed that we think the best of the five books is probably the one we wrote on ICM called Endgame Poker Strategy. Um, it's not the best selling or the best known by any means, but it's the one we personally got the most um, fun out of doing, and and we think it's probably the best of the five books. Like when I wrote the satellite book, I, I pretty much knew satellites inside out, so it was just really a matter of doing a brain dump to Barry 
um, and getting the book out that way. Um, it, every book was slightly different because originally the plan was just to write the satellite book, um, but it went very well and we enjoyed it. So we said, okay, we might as well do another one. So the second one was um, the book on PKOs, which were fairly new at the time online. So I hadn't actually played that many of them and I was kind of starting to study them just for my own purposes so that I'd play more of them online. Um, so that was kind of a, that was more of a process of discovery. Like I was figuring stuff out myself as I went. It, it wasn't something I knew inside out at the start. Then the third book we did was the the one I said was our favorite one on ICM. Um, the fourth one was GTO Poker Simplified. Um, <clears throat> that was kind of a response to people that asked me, were asking me about GTO, and I always recommended a couple of other books. Um, Michael Acevedo's Modern Poker Theory and my friend Andrew Brokos's two books on GTO, Play Optimal Poker 1 and 2. But in a lot of cases, guys were coming back and saying, yeah, I can see they're good books, but they kind of went over my head a bit. Um, I need something more introductory. So we thought we'd, we'd write that introductory book. And then the last one, which we just put out a few months ago, um, <clears throat> that was on Mystery Bounties. And again, similar to PKO, new format. I had to learn it myself anyway. So I thought while I'm learning it, I might as well write a book on it um, and put in all the stuff that I've, that I've learned. So, yeah, that's, that's basically the way the five books came about. Well, well, I'm sorry I didn't name all five of them. My mistake. Um, and I know that that poker strategy, uh, satellite strategy book is a very popular book. Yeah, that's still our most popular for sure. Um, uh, it's it's pretty funny because at the time we, uh, we ended up self publishing because at the time publishers wouldn't publish a book on satellites. They thought it was too much of a niche to, um, that there wouldn't be a huge market for it, um, and. I had no real idea of of, of uh, how much it would sell. Barry gave me a rough idea of how many how much poker books sold, and I was I was like, okay, well that's probably just about worth it. But actually, the book sold about twenty times as much as we expected. That's um, amazing. Good, congratulations on that accomplishment. That's awesome. Yeah, thank but, you. Yeah, I, and I, I like what you said there about um, you know putting something that's introductory out there. Um, I think a lot of times with these trainings, you know, you'll 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 listen, and even somebody that's experienced, like some sometimes they just like the person's talking at at this level where they're at, instead of talking where yeah, their yeah. students are at. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, one hundred percent. I I had some uh, in my previous life. I had some. Mm -hmm. Um, expertise in the area of training and I was I was when I came into poker I was surprised at, at how much training really isn't geared towards the people who are trying to consume it as you say it's it's the guys at a certain level talking at that level but not not necessarily communicating to people who are trying to learn it so we put a lot of effort into that thinking about how to structure the book um how to express all the concepts and, and so on like one thing we always do in our in our books is we put the most important stuff at the start um, because I know from my own experience that I've started a lot of poker books, but I haven't finished a lot of poker books in terms of reading. Um, and a lot of people just don't get to the end of a book. They might re read two or three chapters and then whatever, uh, they don't read the rest. So we thought, okay, well, we put all the most important stuff at the start so that at least if they do bail on the book after two or three chapters, they've got all the most important stuff. So we, we put a lot of thought and effort into that. And the biggest surprise for me on the first book was that the audience was 99% recreational players. Um, and then when it came to writing the other books, there was sort of like recognition, well, okay, that's our audience now. And we have to make sure every time we write a book that it's for that audience so that it doesn't um, overcomplicate things and it focuses on the most important things. I, th I think that's so awesome, you know, like, honestly, because, I mean, with poker, like, for sure, to, if the game's going to grow, we need new people coming in. And, and those people, you know, like, yeah, you, you can't make the bar like so high, they can't understand yeah. anything coming in. So that's so important. Yeah, yeah the, like, there is a natural human impulse, uh, when you become expert in something to make it more complicated than it needs to be uh, you know people invent jargon and that keeps outsiders out etc um 
and I agree with you completely. Like the way the game has to be grown is you have to you have to draw more people in, and yeah. cre- creating any barriers, uh, be they linguistic or anything else, is just not good. Um, Recreationals are the lifeblood of the game, and <laughs> like we got some stick from. Or I got some stick from my fellow pros when I wrote the satellite book saying, well, you're, you're letting out all the secrets out of the bag now and people are going to be better at satellites and we won't be beating satellites by as much. But my attitude has always been that, like, if people are really motivated to learn, they will probably find a way anyway. Um, but also, if you make it easier for them and then they come in and they're playing satellites and they're qualifying for, for live events, then that's growing anyway. That's more important than, you know, trying to maintain a slightly better edge in in one particular type of tournament if you're a pro well i i think you know, you know you're talking about satellites i think that that's something that's kind of missed in what people are saying is like this current poker boom is because when you think back to pre-black friday you had you know the all of these online sites sending people to these live events and um, what no one's realized is, I mean, I, I think I heard like Club GG and Club, Dip, well, probably not Club WPT, but, um, you know, these these online sites are, are now, you know, get finally back, you know, sending people to the World Series and stuff like that. I would have never played the main event the years that I did without that. So yeah. I'm sure like that entry, like... I was, I think I was a year into playing when I won my first main event seat. Like, there is no way I, I was going to put up 10K. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think satellites are, are the core of tournament poker, and, and it's something that people aren't realizing, you know. And that's that how you're going to grow the game. I yeah, mean, that yeah. is the key to growing the game, in my opinion. Um, Dara, talk to us about how you and David um, – started your relationship and that evolved to uh, the chip race po- podcast please sure yeah um so i met david first 12 years ago he had been living in the states um he was a full-time online player at the time and i had encountered him online but um didn't know him personally then he moved back to ireland um and ran into him at a few events uh, he, he was a very prickly individual, it's fair to say. Um, he he was struggling with the move. Um, and I mean, I joke about it now and he and he hates when I say this, but basically he had no friends in Ireland at the time, or at least none in the Irish poker scene. So I kind of felt he needed somebody to um, take him under take him under their wing or whatever so that 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 kind of felt to me but then we went on a few trips uh to different poker events and i found out he was actually very good company um very funny man and when you get to know him he's a teddy bear as well he um the 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 kind of prickly exterior is largely just an exterior um and we and we do share a lot of common interests like we we we're interested in the same sort of things outside of poker uh so we became friends pretty quickly um and then a few years into the relationship we uh david's best friend outside of poker was working for a company that made niche podcasts um so they had a podcast on cricket they had a podcast on horse racing or irish horse racing uh, they had a few other podcasts and they wanted to do a poker podcast and Rob, David's friend, said, "Oh, I know the two guys. I I know the two best guys to do to get to do that." Um, so they came to myself and David, and they said, "Will you will you do the podcast?" So we initially agreed we'd make seven episodes for free, um, because they didn't have a sponsor or anything, uh, and just see how it goes. So we we did that for a few months. We put out the first seven episodes. At, at, for the first seven episodes, it was purely an Irish focus. Um, we were in at the Irish market. The podcast was very popular in Ireland um, and even in the UK as well. People started listening uh, to the point that towards the end of the season, we did get on some UK guests. We got Neil Channing on. Um, but then, unfortunately, the company who owned the podcast uh, went bust. Um, so they went into liquidation. So we were like, okay, well, I guess that's the end of that. Um, and we kind of forgot about the podcast for a couple of years. And then two years later, you know, us and 
they said they were interested in um, signing us as brand ambassadors. And while we were talking to them, they did some research and they they found that we had done this podcast before, which had been very popular. So they said, "Could you bring? Could you guys bring that back?" So we said, "Yeah, sure." Um, well, first of all, we have to see if we're allowed to because we don't we don't actually own it. The, the uh the, the company that went bust owned it so we talked to the liquidator of the company and he agreed to sell us the the the, the rights for a relatively modest amounts so, so so we bought and then we went back to unibet and said yeah okay we can start making the podcast again uh unibet were very keen that it not be an irish only podcast um that it'd be an international podcast so from the second season on uh which was 2017 we were focused more on trying to get um, foreign guests. Now it was it was very difficult in the start because you know people just looked at our guest list and saw a bunch of Irish people and thought, okay, well this 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 is um, not a internationally popular podcast. Um, so we really struggled for a little while getting guests. We were basically leaning on all our British friends to kind of come on the show, um, but we got we got a we got a real boost when. Um, I was friends with Jennifer Tilly and I asked her if she'd come on and she said she would. And as soon as we'd had Jennifer on, it seemed to be a game changer because then when we went to other American guests and asked them if they'd come on the podcast and, and they looked at the list and they saw Jennifer Tilly on the list, they said, OK, well, I guess these guys are serious. So we found it much easier to get guests after that, let's say. What a great story. I love the fact that you guys like had a reunion of the band, so to speak. Yeah. All right. I love that. Um, tell us a little bit about you as the person married. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm married, uh, for 30 years now. Uh, three grown up kids, three, three grown my, yeah, Mrs. Doak, uh, my wife is French originally, um, uh, but we live in Ireland now. Three grown up kids, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky with my wife in that I don't think there are very many women who would accept the idea that at the age of 42 you're just going to give up your very good job and become a professional poker player um it seems good like yeah. takes a strong woman and congratulations on the marriage and children thank you yeah yeah she uh, she's great she also supported me during the running um my running career which which was much shorter than my poker career lasted about five years at the top level and in that she went off and she um, studied sports massage and she used to come with me to events and uh, if I had any injuries or niggles, she was able to help me with all that stuff. So <clears throat> she's always been very, very supportive and uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm really lucky. Like at the time, she gave me no indication that she was worried that I was moving into poker when I told her, but uh, she, <laughs> she told me afterwards that, yeah, she was obviously concerned, but she, uh, she managed to hide that very well. Well, I think the moral to this whole story is that if I know that she's at a poker tournament that I'm at, I can hire her to do a massage is what I'm hearing in this whole conversation yeah. here. Yeah, she's actually quite critical of, of most of the people she sees doing poker massages. She thinks that they're, you know, they're not doing, they're not really doing it properly. Uh, she, she took it very seriously because obviously sports massage is very important. Um in terms of helping the performance of the athlete, and in particular, like if they're if they have an injury, not making the injury worse, which right. which, which massage can do. Right. Um, and tell me, what's your uh, favorite football team? Um, Arsenal. Arsenal. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had we had, we had we had a bad period, yeah. But last, I mean, last year was obviously disappointing in the end, but. Um, yeah, it's pretty funny when I when I met my wife, or well, shortly afterwards, the the manager of Arsenal was from the same town in France as she was from, so um, it was easier to get her into football as a result. I was I was telling uh, I think Sherry or somebody a couple of weeks ago, we went to London and went to I took my daughter to Arsenal camp, mm. and she was the only one there. And my daughter was uh, she she got to the uh, U.S. Soccer Development Academy, so that's the like. Before the youth national teams, that's like the highest level. Oh, nice! And and so the boys there, I guess boys girls don't play soccer as much in London. Um, but yeah, boys, not as much as the states, that's for sure. Um, yeah, Dara, the boys they wouldn't give her the ball, and oh my so God. finally <laughs> they did this drill, and 
Hannah, she does this step over and pushes the ball out and just burns the poor little boy <laughs> and puts it in the upper back corner. And all his buddies nice. are like, oh, it was like the greatest thing they ever saw, I think. <laughs> yeah. He definitely got made fun of though, later on. So um, what what I, I was going to ask you, um, you know, what, like the one time, um, uh, I, as far as like, when you when you go back and you kind of like study your own play and things like that, what kind of things help you uh, in, in in doing that, or what what's what? How do you evaluate your own play? Um, I guess more in, in in recent years, I've learned I've leaned more into the solvers and and the other tools uh, that are available. Um, so I was a very early adopter of PO, the first really good post lap solver. Um, I started using that shortly after it came out. And I've always used H, uh, Holden Resources Calculator as well, uh, the preflop solver. Um, and th- probably in the last, let me think how long, 18 months maybe, GTO Wizard has become the main thing. Um, you can do mass imports. So like I import, I import my hands from my online and it will quickly flag any any potential leaks or errors. And I think that's at, at the stage that I'm at, that's the best way to learn now to, 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 to just try and because uh, you don't know what you don't know. Like you think you're doing it right until, until somebody says, no, actually that's not the way you should be playing that spot. <laughs> you sound, you sound like you've heard uh, mine and Dutch's conversations of every hand that I ever think that I played. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I did what? <laughs> yeah, I've not. I've, I've noticed an interesting thing with some of my students, which is that often, and I, and I would say this is also true to a certain degree of of David Lappin. Often, the hands they're most proud of are actually not very well played hands. Yeah. <laughs> their hands where their hands where they did something weird or unusual, and it happened to work. So yeah. they, think they thought it was brilliant, but 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 like I'm almost making the point that like okay just because you shoved the river and the guy folded like maybe you just ran into the bottom 10% of his range that's all he was folding um but well, yeah and, and you know sometimes like Dutch will tell me why did you like I, I'll be like I wanted him to fold here and he says why do you want him to fold there <laughs> like you're you're yeah. you're this huge favorite and I'm like well yeah but it's like the main event and I, I don't want to go past yeah. he's like yeah, but that's not going to help you win the main event, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, if you're gonna, yeah. If you're going to play like that, so it's just really interesting. I think the other thing too, Dara, is, um, and I don't know if you've ever had this kind of experience. Is you know, um, play. I, I had a I had a hand that I played um, one time, uh, uh, you know, uh, against Lex Valhaus, and and he bluffs me and don't don't anybody look up the clip because it's like the day he's bluffing everybody <laughs> <laughs> and i just look like an idiot on tv like well, the one hand they show me play um but the interesting thing about it dar is like l- l- like a year or two later i got to hear his perspective of the hand and it really just blew my mind of like how he perceived the hand and why he did the things that he did have you ever had that kind of experience where you could sit down with somebody and and talk through something and then you start to see like how they perceived it differently than you and maybe it adjusted your game quite a bit? Uh, yeah, I've had a few of those moments. I, I remember watching uh, an early run at once video um, by one of their instructors and there was a hand he played against me. And so I, so I got his perspective on the hand and at the time, I remember thinking he played the hand really weird. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why he played it that way. But in the video, he explained that he had seen me play, let's say, top pair, top kicker, in a certain way in in, in an earlier hand against another player. And because I didn't play the hand the same way, he he kind of ruled out me having top pair, top kicker, which is actually what I had. Um, and. <sighs> I remember thinking the reason why I played it differently against the other player was that I had the other player tagged as a, as a very weak player. So I always adjust my play when I'm playing against a weaker player. Um, you know, if it's a weak player who folds too much, um, I'll, I'll, I'll play differently to say it's a, it's a weak player I have tagged as a calling station. 
um, you know, if I have top pair, top kick against the calling station, I'm going to bet very aggressively. If I if yeah. if 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 if, the, if I think the guy just loves to bluff, I'm going to let him bluff, and I have top pair, top kicker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas when I'm playing against better players, I just kind of play a, a reasonably standard way. Um, so I, I remember coming out of, think, of that thinking that the, play, the the player in question who made the video had read too much into one hand. Um, and I, and I had a reason for playing the hand that way um, yeah. against the other player, but that just that that didn't mean that I was always going to play top pair, top kicker that way. Um, and I think that's a very common mistake a lot of people make. They see somebody do something and think, okay, well that's what they always do with a set, or that's what they always do when they're bluffing, right. or that's what they always do when they miss their flush draw, or whatever. And the reality is, most players don't do the same thing in every spot. Um, uh, either either they have they have specific reasons for, you know, sometimes bluffing, sometimes not bluffing or whatever, or it just depends on how they feel on the day. Like, you know, we've all played against people who usually play so, a certain way, but on, on one particular day, it's like they've decided today they're not getting bluffed and they're just calling everything or they've decided yeah. they're going to start bluffing. So I think particularly live, um, th- this comes up a lot as well. People, people just read too much into individual hands or, are very small sample sizes. Yeah, and it's interesting though, like how you say that, um, you know, his, his perception of you, your play, and things like that, and that so much affects things. I think that was kind of the surprising thing about that hand because, um, you know, he, he believed that I had a certain hand. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, I, I had like ace king is what he said. And because he thinks I have ace king with no ace or no king uh, on the board on the turn, he's got a gut shot. And, and he he perceives, you know, that he can hit the gut shot. And, you know, I mean, he's probably not going to get paid off. But like either way, like, you know, he can win the hand like by the river with by a showdown or by me folding, you know, not being able to take the pressure. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just really kind of blew my mind to think about like how someone else perceived it. But like you're saying, like you're dealing with imperfect information. So, um, yeah, that's very true. And I actually, the, the book I'm re- re- working on with Barry at the moment is it's specifically on exploitative poker. And one of the things we're trying to get into the book is how pros typically perceive recreational players and how they play against them. And it is pretty common for pros to think that recreational players um, have a very set way of playing that when they bet big, they tend not to be bluffing. Uh, When they, when they make small bets, they tend to not want to face a big bet, not not want to face aggression. Um, And, I mean, of course, the thing is, like, if you realize that, that that's the way they're thinking, you can actually exploit that. But, you know, if they, there are some pros who will literally always fold uh, anything that almost, that, that isn't the nuts or near to a big bet by a recreational player. And if you know that they're going to do that, then you can right. just make a big bet every time you're bluffing and make a small bet every time you, you, you want to get caught. Okay, Dara, <laughs> don't be giving my secrets away now. <laughs> I don't want them to call my big bet. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. I uh, Don't worry, they still won't. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, it's funny, but like... Somebody asked me once, what's the biggest mistake all poker players make? And I said, the, the, the kind of universal mistake that all players are prone to make, irrespective of their level, whether they're weak, average, or strong, is that they tend to think other poker players think the same way that they do. Um, and, that, and, and, you know, that's not the case. I mean, Brian talked about, you know, he was... Lex had a very different perspective on the hand from from, from from his own perspective, and that's that's often the case. You have two players playing the same hand, right. they have very different perspectives, and they think very differently about the game. But you know, you'll hear guys on the other side, like you'll hear pros saying, "Well, you know, get to the river, and I'm at the bottom of my range, so I have to bluff," um, which is true from a game theory perspective if you're playing against a perfect opponent. But if you're playing against, you know, a calling station. Right, never folds the river. Right. It doesn't matter. Like if you, it really doesn't matter where you are in your range. If you if you can't 
if you can't beat the hands he's going to call with, you just don't bluff. Um, and that's sort of, uh, that's because they're thinking about, they're thinking about it incorrectly. They're thinking about it purely in terms of, this is the way I play the spot. If I have a very strong hand, I bet for value. If I have a mediocre hand, I, I check or call. And if I have a weak hand, I bluff. Um, but, you know, the guy they're playing at is just thinking, if I have a pair, I'm calling. <laughs> so, 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 so against that type of player, bluffing just goes out the window. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, you, and you get to these spots where, you know, the smart play is to like just give up at some point, you know. But but like people just can't do it. They've got, you know, they've got their soldiers in the middle, and they're, yeah. they're going after. Them. Yeah. If, if if I had a dollar for every time I've heard the phrase, it was the only way I could win the hand. Yeah. Uh, um, I'd be I'd, I'd, I'd be very rich, but uh, you know, sometimes you just can't win a hand. It's uh, it's you're not you. We interviewed Phil Galfon recently, and he said something which struck with me. He said, "Like you're not trying to win every hand; you're just trying to win chips in the long run." Um, and you know, there are there are, not, there are some hands you just can't win, and any effort you make to to put money into the middle to try and win the pot is just going to be counterproductive. I kind of try to ask our guests, um, you know, we lost a great this year in Doyle Brunson. Had mm. you ever had uh, cross paths with Doyle? Yeah, the very first year I was playing, Doyle came over to the Irish Open, which uh, is the oldest tournament in Europe. Um, it's a very big event they have in, in, in Ireland every year at Easter. And the sponsors brought Doyle over. Um, and I was an online qualifier that year. Um, and we all got to meet Doyle just before I uh, came in and just gave us a short talk on how to play live, basically. <laughs> what a <laughs> lovely it. treat and memory. Yeah, it was great. And, and he was great. Um, he followed me on Twitter then a couple of years before he died. Um, uh, and we had a few back and forth interactions, but nothing major. We were we were actually desperate to get him on the chip race, but he really wasn't keen. He didn't like doing interviews. So... It, it was kind of, um, I guess that's one of our biggest regrets on the chip race that we, we weren't able to interview Doyle because we did interview a few of his friends. You know, we interviewed Mike Sexton and Elia Lesra and a few other people, um, but we were never able to get Doyle, unfortunately. Well, and he will be missed, and he is missed, that's yeah. for sure. Um, are there any um, poker players that you haven't interviewed yet that you are looking forward to doing so someday? Yeah, the, we, uh, we have what David calls our white whale list, which is where we're guys were really, really eager to get. We've tried very hard to get Eric Seidel uh, a few times. Um, we haven't given up on him completely yet. Um, we would like to interview Phil Ivy too, but similar to um, to Doyle, Phil doesn't do that many interviews um, unless on, unless he has commercial uh, sponsor who's putting pressure on him or something like that, which is. Yeah, so it's more it's mostly guys in that um, genre, like the sure. the, the 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 really uh, big live pros. We've been lucky enough to ha- to have interviewed Helmut a few times, and and actually talking in, in terms of the history of the show, getting Helmut was huge for us too. Because once you've had Helmut on your show, you know when 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 future potential guests look at the list and they see his name there, um, it's it, it's obviously a big selling point. Um, and and Phil was great as well. Like um, we had a great time with him. He was a lot of fun. I think the first time we interviewed him, he told us he could only give us ten minutes, and he ended up staying for an hour. And his wife literally dragged him away from the computer in the end. Um, what a nice treat! That's awesome. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and we've um, I've, I've played with Phil a few times too. I've always enjoyed uh, the interactions with him. He he obviously gets some stick for the poker brat stuff. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I've only had pleasant interactions with him. That's awesome. Now, do you have a pap- uh, favorite poker war? I'm sorry, excuse me, a favorite poker room anywhere in the in the world? Um, yeah, it used to be um, the Crown, the Melbourne, uh, the the Crown in Melbourne, where they had the Aussie Millions. Yep, um, that was just an amazing event. Uh, unfortunately. That's gone away now. Um, in terms of, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I, I have to say, the win is pretty sweet in Vegas. Um, 
that's that's it's always fun to play there. Um, the they playground do. in Montreal is good as well. They yeah. do do a good a uh, good job at the wind for sure. Yeah. I haven't had the pleasure of going to the playground, but I've heard great things about it. Well, you know, you know what the wind has, Sherry. The WPT and no. my favorite what? They have the uh, <laughs> strawberry Julius thing. I think it seems like it. <laughs> Brian's favorite the drink same. is at the wind, and I had the pleasure of me of meeting Dara face to face at the wind last wow. December at the WPT. Special. Are you coming this? Are you coming this year? Hoping to come this year, yeah. It, it's very near to um, the Unibet Open in Bucharest, um, but it would be possible to to go to to the win afterwards. So I what told my the... wife I, I'd do less traveling this year. <laughs> so, sure, <laughs> we'll, you will. <laughs> we'll see how she feels about uh, me going to Vegas in December. So they announced a forty million guarantee for that. What yes. what did they hit last year? Do you do you remember? Uh, Twenty seven million. The, the, the guarantee last year was 15 million. And I remember when, when they announced it, everybody said they're crazy. They're not, <laughs> I going, remember to, that. Yeah. They're not going to get one and a half thousand players. Um, they'll be lucky to get 1,000. And they ended up absolutely smashing and getting 2,700 players. Uh, for, 40 million is a big old guarantee. That's a big number. That's, That's a, a very big, big number. That's a big number. I'm going to just do a little housekeeping. First of all, remind everybody of our sponsor, Elevator Results. Uh, we'll post their um, link in our chat in just a moment. Any of you in our audience listening, if you'd like to come up and comment or ask Dara a question, please request right now, and we'll get you approved as we continue this conversation. Thank you. I, I think, Dara, the reason they're able to get that big guarantee this year is is what we were talking about earlier. Like this, the the satellite um, stuff is is making its way, and yeah. you know, Club WPT is going to send how many of those people? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's the way it was last year. Quite a few Irish um, had their first ever Vegas experience. Uh, they qualified online on on WPT Global. Um, the satellites themselves were overlaying, but but uh, it's good to see an operator who is willing to accept a certain amount of overlay and satellites just to get people into the event, because it's a great way of building buzz. Like if you if you satellite in a couple of hundred people and all those people are going, it's not just those people, but they're talking to all their friends about the fact that they're going and that gets other people excited as well. So um, 40, I mean, 4,000 is a lot of people to try and get to, into a 10K and it, it does clash with a couple of other things. Um, it's going to clash with the uh, WSOP in the Bahamas and also um, EPT Prague here in Europe. But I still have a feeling that the event was so good last year. And I think pretty much everybody who was in it, it, there last year wants to go again this year. Well, I'm looking forward to the Irish Open someday. I was supposed to go to the Aussie Millions and the January 2020, and we all know what happened that um, that uh, month. Yeah, yeah. Um, and hopefully someday soon I'll get to the Irish Open. Um, Slay has his hand up. Go ahead, Slay. Dara, Dara, you beautiful man. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say hello to Dara. He's such a lovely fella. Hi, Luke. Great to, great to hear you. We, we were actually talking about you today. Um, we had a meeting with our sponsors and we were talking about Bucharest. And and uh, we were saying, like, we might try and get a few Americans to come this time. And uh, you, your name came up as the kind of person oh, yeah, you would Ken like. Oh, yeah. wants me to go, probably. Yeah. My love. She was, she was very keen. <laughs> uh, yeah. What, where is Bucharest? I mean, I'm obviously not going, but where is it? Uh, it's in Romania. Okay. Um, it's the capital of Romania. It's a beautiful city. Um, I, the first time I was ever there was for a Unibet event about five years ago, and um, hadn't really. I didn't know too much about Bucharest. I got some Romanian city. friends. Uh, you know, Alex Papazian and Vlad yeah. Impaler. Yeah, there's so many good Romanian poker players. It's supposed to be a beautiful city to visit. Um, oh, hopefully, yeah. I'll make it there one day. Um, Slay, take your hand down. We're already addressing you, love. That hand, is, <laughs> that hand is blinding me. Donna, did you have a question or comment? I got freaking chicken wings in my hand. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got you. 
Go Dara, ahead, uh, oh yeah, I don't know. I'll come up with a question. I'm gonna come up with a question. All right, I like it. Go ahead, Don, and tell as we wait for Slay. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to have known Dora for many, many years now. And I have such good memories. What's your favorite memory, Dora? <laughs> There's so many to choose from. Um probably you going around that roundabout endlessly in Brighton, Donna, if I'm gonna if I'm honest. Don <laughs> Donna's a great person, but um yeah, she does she doesn't really do roundabouts. <laughs> I know you were going to bring that one up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we've completely lost the American audience because I don't, I don't know if they even have roundabouts. But um... we do, we do. Oh, you do. Have okay, them cool. And hate them. Yeah, well, just imagine Donna going around, going, "Okay, I'm going to turn." Oh no, I missed my turn. I'm going to have to go around. The... Oh, I missed it again. Oh, I missed it again. You know, she has that effect on me. She was, she was keeping me company on uh, two different trips I was on. She was keeping me company on the phone and. You know what? I missed my accent both times. It's you, Donna. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's you. Okay, Merv, what you got for us, please? I know you've already met Dara, but say hello, bud. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good day, Dara. Great to uh, hear, hear and speak to you again. Uh, so, sorry, it's not in Australia. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I just had a, a question um, because uh, you know, David Lapper and Kat, as we made it to spaces before you, and this is your sort of first time here, did they give you any uh, advice or anything to uh, look out for? Uh... Um, no, they didn't. I know Kat's, Kat, Kat, Kat loves her spaces. Um, I, I don't think David has dabbled that much. I've actually popped into a few spaces just to listen to people. Um, um, but yeah, this is, my, this is my first time speaking. But yeah, they, no, they, they they were absolutely no use on that front. Um, they could give me no pointers <laughs> whatsoever. We have, well, a, I... we have a, a question uh, in the chat. I don't, I don't know if you saw it yet, Sherry. You Go want ahead. To it? Go right ahead. So uh, the question is from John Robertson. He's he's uh, doing a uh, high school football game uh, <laughs> announcing, so he can't he can't jump on here. We're, we're space junkies, so we're. We're always in here, uh, and uh, even when we can't talk. But his question is, as a serious rec player who loves to read and study poker, where would you recommend a player like me spend their time studying? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, like, the way poker has changed since I started is that when I started, there was very there was very little good content out there. I mean, this was even before people made training videos, so there was pretty much just a few books of, of, of varying uh, quality. Um, we mentioned Doyle Brunson already, and, and Doyle's book was w was huge for me at the start. But now, the way the world has gone, there's just so much content out there that it's the challenge is kind of like figuring out um, what what's best for you. It's a different answer for everybody. Um, I would say that. Like, I have about 20 students at the moment, and they constantly ask me for recommendations and I give different people different recommendations because people have different ways of learning. Some people learn better from watching videos. Some people learn better from working with a solver themselves. Some people work better, learn better from even watching Twitch or something like that or reading. Um, in terms of the training sites, I think there are a couple of very good training sites out there. Um, I make content for, um, we've mentioned Learn Pro Poker already. I, I did the satellite masterclass for them. I also make content for Faraz Jack's site. The thing I liked about Faraz's site when I looked at it um, before I started working with them was that it's, it's very focused on recreational players. Faraz has a very similar philosophy to mine that you don't... When you're, when you're teaching people who have a limited amount of time, you know, they're not, they're not full-time pros, um, they're recreational players. It's more about what you decide not to tell them than what you decide to tell them. You, you, you don't overwhelm them with information. You focus on the really important stuff, um, the stuff that they're going to get the most from. And I think Faraz has that approach nailed down pretty well. So I, I always uh, recommend Faraz's site as well. For, and there are, other, there are other sites, other very good sites as well. BBC stuff is very good. Uh, run at once. They're probably the the OGs in the in, in this area. Um, they still put out good stuff as well. So, yeah, they're probably the main ones I'd recommend. And by the way, John also says that he's read all but one of your uh, 
one of your um, books. So, um, oh, so he's a big, big fan. Excellent. Yeah, we, uh, we're very lucky that, um, as I said, like the first book did very well. And then we've had a few people say that they buy the other books because they enjoyed the, fir- the first book so much. Um, and that's there's a kind of responsibility to keep keep the quality up then um, and also to, as I said earlier, like just be mindful of your audience. Um, try and make sure that the, that every book you come out with is, is, is aimed at them. The fact that I, that I write them with Barry actually kind of helps because Barry is, is, is himself essentially a recreational player. Um, so, you know, they say that to you, you don't you don't really know something unless you can explain it to a child and in poker terms barry's kind of a child so um <laughs> you guys work well together we work very well together yeah i explain it to him and then the child writes it up so it's even better <laughs> all right i'm gonna go back to slay what you got for us bud oh yeah uh, i want to know your opinion on all these just handing out bracelets going out of fun. oh my god it's just gone ridiculous now at this yeah. stage it's I mean the bracelet used to be a big deal to me like that that used to be on my list of things I really wanted to do and now I'm really not that pushed because they give what they're giving out like 200 this year or something that's, um, so that's a lot yeah now don't get me wrong um, obviously I love you want to win a tournament everyone yeah you, you yeah it, it depends on the tournament like most of most of the most of the ones in Vegas um, you know you'd feel good about winning but like you know, it wasn't a bracelet, but there was a circuit event in London recently, and they had a flip and go, um, and it got twenty seven runners, <laughs> um, and the final table had five people on it. So basically, you had to win a flip to get onto the final table, and then you had to beat four yeah. other players. And, and then you, you got I, a bracelet for that. I, I, uh, you got a ring, basically. Wow. Um, but uh, but yeah, like so you know, I I don't think all bracelets are created equally. Um, you know, if you win a, like a, a 100 flip and go on GG, you get, a, you get a, a bracelet in theory as well. But I don't think anybody would give that sort of the same credibility or status as winning a live bracelet at the actual WSOP. But Dara, it was four of the best players in the world, right? It was like the 250 kids. <laughs> Negreanu and I had this, yeah, this yeah. dispute on Twitter one time about how they, you know, they, they started to have this, like, alternate World Series of Poker, and that was the only one that mattered, and those people deserve Player of the Year every year. So, yeah, I'm glad that, that you know, at least it seems like, you know, those guys have to come and play the other events, too, if they're going to if they're gonna try to make a run at it. So, yeah, agreed. It's pretty... I see Donna has her hand up again. Go ahead, love. Yeah, first off, give my love to Mrs. Dope. Tell her I miss her. Yeah. And second of all, don't forget, you've done some excellent webinars that I've been involved in. And actually, I learned a lot. So they could, you definitely need to revisit those. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Donna. You, 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 uh, to explain to listeners, I have done a few webinars before my hookup with uh, Faraz on different topics of interest, uh, like satellites, etc. And always got Donna. Obviously, she's the best moderator out there. So um, I've, I've always got Donna in to do all that stuff. Oh, so yeah. Where can we uh, find those webinars? Oh. Sorry, Brian. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> they might. Th- I think some of them might be still on my landing page, darrowcarney dot com. I'm not sure though, because I, I I remember we withdrew we withdrew the satellite one, for example, after I did learn the learn pro poker one because um, the learn pro poker one was more in depth, um, uh, so it kind of superseded it. Um, I, I, Barry Barry kind of oversees all that stuff for me, so I'd have to ask him where they actually are now. Okay, perfect. And what is your favorite poker game to play? Are you a mixed player? Do you just love the No Limit? What's your favorite? Um, I played most of the games, but not not very much. Um, I'm I'm very much a holding specialist in terms of um, what I that, that's like ninety nine percent of my volume. Uh, 
I think my favorite of the other ones, let's say, that I've tried is um, Oma High Low, um, because that's just very strategically rich. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to think about in Oma High Low because you're you're competing for both the high and the low, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's probably my favorite game. Okay, cool. Uh, Sly, go ahead, bud. All right, it's a three part question. Um, what did you first of all? What did you do before you were playing? Uh, secondly, um, do you think that French babes are the most beautiful babes in Europe since you married one? And thirdly, <laughs> do you have any uh, French cinema recommendations? I've been watching French movies lately. Oh, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Um, okay, so uh, what what I did before. Um, I studied electronic engineering in college and never actually worked in that field, went straight into software. Um, and I was basically in software for 20 years before poker. Um, so that's what I did before. Uh, definitely, I, I'm definitely very partial to the French, I have to say. Uh, not just not just the women, but the whole culture. Yeah, um, I know you love women. And the women it's as well. Awesome. The women are great. <laughs> uh, French, 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 French women are, yeah, they're they're definitely uh, pretty pretty unique. Um, oh, yeah. Pretty spicy. Eh? I never dated a French babe. So you know? Oh yeah, it's, uh, I, it's, I yeah. like French babes though. Yeah, and in terms of movies, um, I think. Depending on what kind of vintage you want to go, if you go back to the early French stuff, the the new wave um, directors like Jean Luc Godard, there's some very good stuff there from the sixties. And um, I personally got into French movies in the eighties, so uh, I think the first French movie I saw was Betty Blue. And when you're used to mainstream cinema and Betty Blue, I won't spoil it, but the way it starts is just like holy. What, what what on earth am I watching? And all movies is is just a trip. So yeah, eighties French movies are, pre are pretty special as well. I think uh, there's a whole. I, I I went through a period where every French movie that came to that got that got a release in Ireland, I I would be there uh, on the first day because I absolutely love French movies. Um, yeah, again, it's it's just like the French culture is so unique. Um, it's yeah, I'm 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 not really doing it justice, but French movies are very different, and um, I mean, they sometimes get parody. People say that like nothing ever happens in a French movie, but people talk about the fact that nothing's happening endlessly. Um, but yeah, uh, if 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 you if you've liked the French movies you've seen so far, I would definitely recommend checking out the the eighties classics like Betty Blue, Subway. Um, those those films basically. Well, great recommendations, I'm sure. Thanks, bro. Well, uh, Slay's coming up with some good questions here. I'm liking it, Slay. Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. If you want to hear Mrs. Doak, they actually did a chip race podcast with Mrs. Doak, Sharon, and Emma. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah, in's well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in's why, and Mrs. Doke's segment had me in absolute stitches. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when we recorded that. The idea originally was just that we would get the partners to do a short bit, uh, but then Murray's bit went so well that when we finished recording it, David said we have to make that a, a, a proper actual interview. Um, um, yeah, she probably she probably stole that episode. I think it was the, the it was some special episode. It was like the fiftieth ever, um. So we wanted to do something special, and we got such a good reaction that we brought her back for a second interview as well. Um, yeah, she's a very funny woman. So, um, I definitely recommend listening to that. We will do it. Thank you, Donna, for bringing that up. So we have something to watch when we're done here tonight. Um, in two thousand fifteen, um, you were the you know, second place winner of the $1,500 No Limit event at the WSOP. What were some of the takeaways after that um, great run in that tournament for you? What were some of the takeaways for you? Um, probably the, the biggest thing I got out of that was just a confidence boost because 
up until that point, I'd never really done well in Vegas. Um, like I was very lucky w- w- with my poker career. I obviously ran well for the first year or two. So, you know, I, I literally won the first big live tournament that I entered in, in, uh, in Europe and I did very well online from the start, but, uh, but every year I'd go over to Vegas and I would just like do my bollocks as they say. Um, it just n- it never, it never worked out for me. And there was a couple of reasons for that. I, I think I wasn't adjusting well to the different population tendencies and also the structures were different from what I was used to back home. I was used to playing slower structures back home, but, but I remember around 2012, I was so disheartened by my record in Vegas that I, I, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm just not going to bother going to Vegas anymore. Um, I'm just getting going over there every summer, getting beaten up. So, the, so in 2012, I actually didn't go. I stayed at home and watched the Olympics. Um, but then I, next year I decided to go again I don't think that went great either and then 2014 but then 2015 I had my big um, run there and I mean as tournaments go it was kind of weird because what happened was I was doing commentary for the live stream with David Tuckman on the seniors final table um, and that was that was the same time as this tournament was starting so I looked at the schedule and I said okay I won't enter that 1500 unless the final table is done by a certain time. And I remember looking at my watch about 20 minutes before that cutoff time, and there were still five people left in the tournament uh, that I was commentating on, uh, which was won by Dan Highmiller. Um, but then Dan just mowed through the other four guys and knocked them all out in 20 minutes. So I ran off to, to lay it register the other tournament. Um, but because I came in late... Um, I, I was relatively short stacked and my main memory for most of the tournaments is just being short stacked uh, like having 10 to 20 big blinds folding, folding, folding finding a hand to shove doubling up when I needed to um, and that just went the whole way through the tournament uh, remember got to the bubble short got down to the last three tables short when we went to the final table I was 8 of 9 with 16 big blinds um, but <laughs> But yeah, it was, it was obviously great to get heads up. Um, there were some good players on the final table too. Jason Kuhn was on that final table and um, Matt Dolan was there as well. And obviously Yupeshka who ended up winning. Win, that was his first bracelet. I think he's had two other bracelets since. Um, but it just, I, I guess the main takeaway I got from it was that, I'm at, that, that even though I was, what age was I in 2015? Uh, I just turned 50. Even though I was into my fifties, um, I was still I could still be competitive over there, um, and I have done better in Vegas since. Like I, ha- I had another somewhat deep run the following year, uh, and I've had I've been more consistent caches, <clears throat> let's say, uh, in, in in the year since. I've uh, had a final table two years ago as well. So yeah, it was just kind of the confidence, and um, yeah, it's it's down in my hand mob. Uh, as as a second because I did obviously come second um, I lost the heads up but we had actually done a chop um, before we went back to play the last day so I actually got a bit more money than the and the mob says as well awesome we always like a good chop don't we Brian <laughs> <laughs> well the best the best kind of chop is where is, is where you agree to chop and then three hands later you get it in flipping and you lose the flip Hell yeah! <laughs> and you're like okay well i'm glad i did that shop now oh yeah go ahead donna yeah it was the 50th anniversary and it started gently as well that's right so that, the, the episode with mrs doke yeah yeah we got jennifer back for that show because she had been our most popular guest up to that point and and we got Mrs. Doak. So I think that's probably, that might be the only time we've had two female guests uh, as the two interviews. Um, awesome. We've got to work on that. Yeah, we have, it, we, we have a general rule that we try to make sure that at least 25% of all the guests every year are female. Awesome. Um, obviously, that's more than the representation of women in poker, but... Yes, there there are a lot of great female guests um, that we've had down the years, and uh, yeah, we do always try to make sure because you you look at some poker podcasts and it's like they think women don't exist in the poker world. You know, there's almost no female guests, and you're like, what 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 are they doing? Like, uh, we're trying to promote 
we're trying to get more women into poker, trying to promote poker as something that women can play um, on an equal footing with men. Um, but yes, uh, uh, often there's in, in many areas they're still underrepresented. I mean, in, of course, uh, yeah, of course. And I'm going to tell you something um, here in the spaces, as you probably know. Um, there were some um, times spaces were not very nice to women that were in it. And I'm going to tell you, it's had an ever everlasting effect. I have actually asked some very um, high profile female players to come on our, um, on our show, Poker Insiders. And their response was, you know what? When I was in there listening on so-and-so's, it was so volatile. I don't want anything to do with the spaces. And they won't even come into the spaces anymore, which is so unfair and unfortunate that a bad apple ruined it for the rest of us. Um, but hopefully they will, the word will get out that, you know, what we're doing and others are doing um, is not that volatile um, nonsense. And so hopefully they will come around. But, you know, opportunity i i yeah. want to give everybody the opportunity yeah yeah absolutely yeah no it, 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 it's so important and um like it, for me there's always been a contrast between the world i was in before the running world and the poker world like in the running world that i was part of um you know bad, bad behavior towards women just wasn't tolerated um you know the the, the men would ostracize a guy who who um spoke spoke to female runners the way that poker, male poker players often speak to female poker players and then you come into poker and it's complete it's the complete opposite it's like it feels almost like going back in time um exactly. it's almost it's almost like uh you know the women's liberation movement never happened and we're we're still somehow stuck in the 50s or 60s where it's okay to um to pick on women it's it, yeah it's it, it's it's just mind boggling to me to me too, but we're working on it. And, you know, together we will make it happen so that everybody feels welcomed and comfortable at a poker table because that's the only way we can grow the game and get new money on the table. Because look at it this way. There's 5% of the field are women. And if we can get it, that up to even 45%, that's all new money, gentlemen. All new money on the felt. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Want to get women into poker just so you get their money? Come on, Sherry. Oh, come on. You know, it's just another motivation for people like you, Slay. Come on, Sherry. No, no. I just want to, I want more women at the table so I can ask them on dates, you know, like a real pervert. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, if you're in the audience right now, we'd like to ask um, Dara a question or have comments, please request. Um, on the bottom left of your screen and we'll bring you up um, so you can have the opportunity to speak with our guest. I've actually been on Dara's uh, podcast twice. Good times. Yeah. Yeah, we've... Uh, we've all, it's, it's always fun talking to Luke. He's a treat. <laughs> You're great in person as well. Just a larger than life character. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I will look forward to that meeting someday. Yes, so will I in December. <laughs> Let's go. I gotta make it. This, we gotta make it to December first. You know, no, tomorrow isn't promised. <laughs> Dora, I want you to tell everybody about your story with David Bowen because uh, I know yeah. it. Yeah, but like, I don't think a lot of people know about him. And you and David being friends. Yeah, I, basically, I was a big boy fan in my youth, and um, when the internet started in the early '90s, kind of the first thing I was really interested in in doing was checking out if there were any um, boy fan sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I used to interact with all the boy fans online. That was most of my actually online interactions in the early days. And uh, a couple of years into it, um, I started getting emails from somebody who was talking as if they were David Bowie. Um, now, in the early days of the internet, it was pretty common for people to just impersonate celebrities. So my initial assumption was that this was just a 
an impersonator. Um, I, I had dealt with a few of those before, but uh, but I thought, well, if it's an impersonator, it's a very good impersonator because he, he was very convincing. Uh, he, he expressed himself the way that David Bowie did. He seemed to think he was interested in the same things that I knew Bowie was interested in, etc., etc. So, I, like, I never really said, I think you're an impersonator or I think you're Bowie. I just dealt, dealt with them as as they presented and we had a lot a lot of emails um which we, ch- we exchanged a lot of emails and then uh the first clue i got that it might be actually boy or somebody within his w- within his group was he was going on a show in in the uk on the bbc um with a guy called jeremy paxman and pa- paxman wanted to talk to him about the internet so at the time I was an expert in the internet because I was in software and um, so, so we, we kind of had a detailed discussion uh, about where the internet might, might how it might develop. This is the, this is the mid, to, mid to late 90s now, so it's still very early days of the internet. And then I watched the, dis- the discussion between Paxman and Bowie and Bowie literally used a few phrases that had come up uh, during our discussion. So so I was like, oh, that's interesting. If If it's not Bowie that I'm talking to, it's at least somebody within his group who's advising him. Um, and then I think it was the following year he was doing a concert in Dublin. And uh, we were still, we, at this stage we were exchanging probably about two emails a day. Uh, and he, he yeah, he, he, he asked me what he should do. It, he wanted to do something special on the stage when he, when he took the stage in Dublin. So he said, um, England had just won the Rugby World Cup. He said, should I talk about that? And I was like, mm, England winning the World Cup is not really that big a deal in Ireland. Um, if anything, probably most of the Irish were cheering for the Aussies. Um, <laughs> so I, I, would, I wouldn't bring that up. And he was like, okay, well, what should I do then? And, and as purely as a joke, I said to him, uh, when you go on stage, when you go on stage tonight, say Chucky or Low, which... Um, is the uh, IRA slogan. Um, it means our day will come in Irish. Um, and, and it was purely as a joke. I thought it'd be hilarious. A guy, li- at the time he was wearing a jacket, which was literally a union jack. And I thought it would be funny if a guy wearing that went on stage <laughs> and said the IRA slogan. Uh, he, he also said to me, um, I can put you on the guest list if you like. And I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, s- still not really believing I was talking to him, but thinking maybe it was somebody in his organization um, That's hilarious. So I said, yeah, sure, put me on the guest list. Now, I had a couple of tickets anyway, um, so I wasn't relying on the guest list to get in, but th- there was a couple of fans I knew who weren't able to get tickets. So I said to them, okay, um, I might be able to sell you my tickets, but I don't know yet. I'm going to have to check something for... I went along to the point where the concert was, and I remember going up and thinking, this this, this is not going to end well. I'm going to, I'm going to get humiliated here when I, when I tell the guy I think I'm on the guest list. And they look and they go, no. So I went up and I said to the security, um, I think I'm on the guest list. And he was like, well, what's your name? So I gave him my name and he pulled out this list. And I could see that it was a very short list. There was only three or four people on it. Uh, and he goes, yeah, yeah, you and, you and one other person. So <laughs> myself and my wife got in on the guest list. And I, we gave the tickets to our friends um and that was that was for me that was kind of the confirmation that yeah it was actually david boy i was talking to um because he had said he would put me on the guest list and he and he did put me on the guest list and he and and he he also repeated the phrase that i told him to say um in the concert (laughs) that's amazing (laughs) Yeah. yeah but it was so bizarre like we never met in person um, it was a purely email thing. It, um, it, it was kind of a precursor of the way the world has gone now, where you know you interact with lots of people online, and you and you, you actually know them better than the people around you uh, to a large degree because you're talking to them every single day, um, and you talk about stuff that you wouldn't necessarily talk about to your neighbours. Um, and 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 that's the way it kind of was. Like it was a very intense correspondence for about seven years then he had a heart attack and he essentially retired um he came back and and made a couple of albums just before he died but he spent a couple of years out of the limelight and in that period we didn't really communicate all that much beyond wishing each other happy birthdays or happy christmas um but 
but yeah, it, 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 very bizarre. I I remember before I knew that it was definitely him I was talking to. Um, I was backstage at one of his concerts, and he came into the room to meet and greet the various celebrities that were that were there to see him. So that was the only time I was in close proximity to him. But like, there was that, that was a case of like fifty people crammed into a small room, so there was no interaction either. So. Yeah, one of the one of the weirdest relationships in my life. Um, like, never really met him in person, but exchanged a huge amount of messages with him and got got to know him very well. That's awesome! What a great story, and may God protect him in heaven. And uh, what a great entertainer uh, he is. Sorely missed for sure. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Dara. I love that story. That's Thanks, a Donna. great story. I'm glad you brought it up, Donna. ASG, what you got for us, bud? Yeah, so it sounds like you're uh, kind of a rec advocate. So I was wondering uh, how much of a problem you think it is that so many operators are now going for higher guarantees that have large rebuys and uh, long late registration. And if there's a way to like... Uh, make that a thing that the operators are less interested in doing because that seems to, you know, sell seats. But at least to me as a rec, it doesn't seem like something that works for me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's terrible for poker. I think re-entries in, in, in general are terrible because um, apart altogether from just the optics of pro gets knocked out, immediately rebuys, comes back in, gets knocked out again, rebuys, and still ends up on the final table because... Because it's 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 endless reentry, um, and and I know that doesn't sit very well with recreational players who you know might only have one bullet, um, but also it just makes the field uh, materially tougher. Like in the old days, if you take something like the Irish Open, you know, let's say there were five hundred runners, fifty of them are pros, uh, and four hundred and fifty of them are recreationals. Now it's unlimited reentry. The pros can fire nine bullets. And if they're firing on average, let's say four or five bullets, and the recreations aren't, then essentially it goes from like a nine to one ratio in favor of the recreations to a two to one ratio, and that's just that's just bad for everybody. But the problem is, you can understand. I I, I fully understand why operators do it. They get more people. They get bigger prize pools. And they obviously make more rake. Um, and it's one of those things where. I don't think people realize, first of all, how bad it is and how bad late registration is in, in particular. And like, I've made a point of explaining in, 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 in two of my books why late registration is so profitable. Um, and the reason for that is, I think if, if late registration is going to exist, and it clearly is, I, I can't imagine any operator getting rid of it uh, anytime soon, it's still kind of unfair a large portion of the field doesn't realize that they're at a disadvantage coming in from the start um, and that those are all recreational players. So I think at the very least, we have a, a duty to, uh, to, to get the message out that, look, you can go in from the start of a tournament. That's fine. Um, you know, it's your money. You do what you like. But just be aware of the fact that the pros are doing our max later registry because that's profitable for them to do so. And that money doesn't come from nowhere. That money comes from the people who, who come in from the start. Um, but I think it's going to be very hard to get it to change because people focus on big prize pools, you know, and, you know, the Irish Open has a 1 million guarantee these days. They're not going to get that by by making it a freeze out. Um, I, th- I, 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 think, I think the best we can hope for is maybe at least some sort of limit. Uh, I, I kind of like the idea of maybe you're allowed a single re-entry. Um, so, you know, if, if the first bullet goes badly, uh, you're, you're, you don't have to go home. You can, you, can, you can fire a second bullet. But I think the unlimited re-entries are terrible for the ecosystem. They're terrible for recreational players, particularly terrible for recreational players. They're not even good for pros. The only people they're good for are the tournament organizers who get more rake. Um, I agree. And I'm, a, I'm even okay with one re-entry a day if there's four flights and, you know, yeah. One will be entry a day. I'm good with that. But unlimited entries, it really does ruin it for the rec players. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing, late registration, like uh, th- obviously there has to be some amount of late registration. You can't have somebody like turning up five minutes late and they're out of the tournament. Um, that, 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 that that wouldn't be desirable. But, but you know, you're getting tournaments now where it's possible to come in on day two. Um, EPTs are like that, I think. And WSP main event, you can come in halfway through day two. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and some of the big tournaments, guns, I, th- I, th- I think that's kind of, too extreme. I think you should. That should be capped at like three or four hours as well. Um, so that if somebody can't be there for the very start, that's fine. They can come in a couple of hours late. But the idea that somebody can skip an entire day just feels weird. And again, like in a sense, I'm talking against my own interests here because, for the most part, when I play live, I do max late reg because I know it's the most profitable thing to do and it's the it's the most efficient use of my time. Um, but I. But I would prefer that that wasn't an option. I agree. Um, Now for a word about our sponsor, who is Elevator Results, whose purpose is to provide a service to help people reach their desired fitness goals, whether it be to gain weight, to lose weight, or to improve their sports performances. Elevator Results can help you reach your goals. Thank you. So what what do you are you you're, you're coming out for the WPT championship? You said there. Uh, I'm I'm not a hundred percent yet. I'm probably about ninety percent. Um, but yeah, I I I told my wife I play less live this year, and I played a lot. <laughs> um, and I, I I have a few other things scheduled before then. I'm probably going to go to Cyprus for the EPT. Um, there's some stuff in Ireland on, and there's the Unibet event in Bucharest. Um, so. I'm going to see how I feel basically when December comes. If I if I'm feeling like tired and burned out a bit, um, which which I sometimes do after a lot of live poker, um, I might skip it. But I, but I think I'll. But but yeah, I'll probably be there because last year was so good. Um, it was my favorite event of last year. They did such a great job. Uh, go ahead, Donna. Yeah, you better be there because I'm going to be there in December. Yeah, I saw that on Facebook. And I've not brilliant. seen you for ages, and I'm missing yeah. them. Yeah, I can't remember that. When, when was the last time we saw each other? Oh, God knows. It's been a few years now. Pre-pandemic. Oh, Madrid. Oh, my God. Madrid, yeah. Yeah, pre-pandemic. Madrid when I saw Morel. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm del- delighted to see you'll be there. Uh, you'll have a great time. The wind is, the wind's an amazing place. Were, were you there in the wind for the Unibet Open when we had it in 2018? No. No. No, I was moderating on that bloody Twitch channel. So we're on Vegas time. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting trip. That was the uh, the weekend of the mass shooting, if you remember. Yeah, it was. And I was scared for everybody over there. Yeah. Yeah. We had, myself, mean, and David, that- myself and David were doing commentary on the final table. So we were sequestered and we had no idea what was going on. <laughs> except one of the security men came in and said, you can't leave this room until we tell you. Uh, and, and then we saw all the players leaving the final table. Uh, and we were like, "What? What on earth is going on?" So we 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 did what everybody does these days: go on Twitter and see what's happening. Yeah, I remember that day like it was yesterday. But also, as well, what you what you've started doing now, you and David, is being commentators, and you and David in the commentary booth, you bounce off one another, and people miss out. Because it's like Cyprus, Triton and things like that. You and David have got so much information that you give out for free that people don't people don't understand or underestimate watching these YouTube channels or Twitch channels yeah. where you and David are actually commentating. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Don. That's, that, that's great to hear. Like When we do commentary, we do try to make it as informative as possible and also entertaining obviously as having david like we, we've known each other for 12 years now as i said and we uh we've done so much stuff together that we sort of just we, we we've got we've got good chemistry between us let's say we know how to set each other up for for the stuff and 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 there is a kind of a division of labor as well like uh, i'm more the strategy guy and david is more the uh, the the color guy or whatever you want to call him um so (laughs) it does does work quite well and it works well and i highly recommend you check out um 
their podcast at the chip race and um, anybody else have any questions or comments? I think we can wrap it up so Dara can enjoy his uh, rest of his day. Um, also, there's the lock-in on YouTube. There's the books on Amazon. And look out for when Dara and David are actually doing commentary in the booth uh, because she'll pick up a lot of information regarding hands, hand histories, how to play, what would be the best thing, and things like that. And Dara, I love you and I miss you loads. Thanks, John. I'm really looking forward to seeing you. Yeah, I'll, de I'll definitely try and get to Vegas. I was delighted to see that you were going to be there. So um, that'll make it even more special this year. Uh, Murph, what you got for us, bud? Oh, thanks. Uh, I just also wanted to remind everyone if they wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, Dara. Uh, that was a great chat, Dara, when we met at uh, Aussie Millions. Uh, we did the podcast up in the apartment. Uh, yeah, very fun times for me. It was ep episode 77. Uh, we have a, a great strat chat hand and we were talking about satellites as well. So, uh, yeah, just a, a small plug for uh, Post Block Poker Podcast, episode 77. But Dara, it's always great hearing from you. Um, yeah, and I, I hope we see you in some of the uh, taking down some first first places. Uh, you deserve it. Man. Yeah, th thanks, Marv. Um, it's 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 really sad to me that the Aussie Millions isn't there. I was my, I was planning to go to the Aussie Millions every year for as long as I'm playing poker. Um, I, I met a friend of mine in, in Vegas who's trying to get something going in Melbourne um, so I definitely want to get back to Melbourne and, uh, and, and play poker there again Yeah, there is definitely some scuttlebutt about some folks trying to do some stuff there so I am keeping my fingers crossed because like you I haven't been there, you have, but like you I uh, hope to go again in the future, right? So, um, and Brian, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, no, it sounds good. Sherry, we're all good. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone joining us this evening. If you're in Nomad's um, football pool, he's going to be going live shortly in a space to do your fantasy football. Um, and I'm sure there's a few of you in here. <laughs> and uh, good luck with that, you guys. Dara, thank you so much for joining us. You've been a delight as always. Donna, love you. Brian, thank you. Thanks. Have a great day, everybody. Or evening. Thanks, guys. Love you, too. Bye-bye. Thanks for everybody.